Senator Hovind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Where's your sidekick today? He knew you were coming. <laughs> Scared him off? Well, when uh, Senator Murkowski leaves, that means I'm the ranking Republican. You so can take over. We, we could, we could be do chairman some, if you want. Maybe we could do some serious, do some serious business. We're just so happy to have you. You're a good man. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I guess my question is, you know, we talk about fusion being the energy source of the future. What's to say it's not always going to be the energy source of the future, right? You've heard that before, meaning, gee whiz, it seems to be a long time in coming. I mean, I can remember as a little kid, my dad talking about fusion being better than fission and, uh, you know, reading stories about the super collider and the effort in Texas. And, you know, this has been going on for a long time. So I guess my question is, you know, uh, is it really going to happen? When's it going to show up? Is it commercially, and is it going to show up in these smaller applications or the the larger applications? And you can, you all get a shot at this one in any order you want. All right. Thank you, Senator, for the question. And and of course, you know, the, I, I'm sure there's going to be very good, very good answers for this one. Um, we have to remember that many of the major novel technologies that we live in today uh, took a long time to get there and translate. I mean, this is, this is a reality. I will say that what's wonderful, what's happening today, as opposed to even just 10 years ago, you can go to, you know, Devons, Massachusetts, or go over to Everett, you know, Everett, Washington, and watch what is happening in the private sector. It's a daily, Ryan is a daily race, if you will, in building prototypes towards fusion energy demonstration. That's exciting. Our program, in fact, now, um, now that you know, you, we're, I'm in this position now for a little bit over a year ago, as a material scientist and engineer myself, a nuclear engineer, it's also exciting to see the fact that in our program, we're also trying to really rethink how we're thinking about fusion. And you're right. It's always been this 20 to 30 year outlook and when is fusion gonna be ready? What gives me confidence and, and comfort, actually, in, in seeing is all of the technology developments outside fusion that's impacting fusion energy development today. I mentioned earlier AIML. There are advances, for example, in high temperature materials also that we're taking advantage of. So what you're seeing, Senator, is a convergence of a lot of these technologies that's helping accelerate many of the approaches that we're seeing the over $7 billion investment in the private sector realized. So that means we're gonna be actually using it in a commercially viable way when? Next year, two years, five years? So the timeline I think that, that we're really focused on right now is making sure that the science and tech gaps that we do have on some of these approaches are, are addressed right now, right? Mm -hmm. In a decadal time frame, that's been the focus. We're looking at, you know, in the 2030s for us to be able to see those fusion pilot plants, which are demonstrating the, all of the t integration of these technologies that are on the path towards realizing, let's say, electricity on the grid. But there's some approaches, in fact, that can get there even faster. And I will but go ahead and yield the, the time here. But when you say the 30s, that still sounds like, oh, we're 10 years away. Well, you know, again, so the question is, Technology development and translation, it, it does take time, right? And so the question is, and your, and, and, and your question is alluding to what time scale that is. I'm not alluding and, to it. I want you to tell me specifically yeah. when we're going to be using fuel. Because well, that's the same answer you could have given five right. years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. What I can tell ago, you is in the, last, in the last decade, we've made significant strides to be able to close a lot of these sites. You're still not telling me that within five years, we are going to have a commercially viable pilot project, and it's going to look like this. That, yeah. That's what I'm asking. And if you can sure. tell me that I understand, but that's the specific question I'm asking. Sure. Because your sure. answer no. could have been given. We could have been sitting here 10 years ago, and you could have given that answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate, the, I appreciate the question, Senator. I think the, the answer, at least the way I, I would like to, to, to respond to this, is the fact that we are making strides in being able to close those gaps. And we see that in the next half decade to decade. Yeah. I'd love to give you a very precise answer to this question. We are on track to have the first ever commercially operating fusion plant in 2028. 
providing power to Microsoft. We have a firm power purchase agreement with Microsoft. What's that going to look like? What's it going to look like? So uh, for us, the actual Fusion machine itself is something called a pulse system, and I'm happy to go after hearing and, and dive in all the tech weeds on that, but essentially just, it's just a machine. Just explain, if you will. Yeah. The magnet, the magnet that we've seen in Eater versus the pulse mm -hmm. system, just it might, might help Senator Hoven, help me too. How we're different? Different. The pulse, different right. from what the uh, sure. Eater I love talking about this, yes. So um, back in the 40s and 50s, um, when Fusion was really emerging as a concept, there were, uh, pulse concepts were actually already under consideration back then, along with the tokamak design. Um, which is what you're seeing out in, in IDER. And so the main difference here is that you have a steady state design, which is what IDER is, where you're trying to actually contain long-lived plasmas, so you're, that needs to be contained for a long period, whereas a pulsed system is actually saying, no, let's actually just do small amounts of fusion in very quick increments repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really the difference. And it, and it helps reduce the size of the machine does significantly. The pulse, does the pulse, I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm good with as long as you are. Yeah. No, I, I just want to know, does the pulse uh, able to ramp up, ramp down, basically? Yes. More so because one eater, when she's produced, it's got to produce. Yes. So precisely. So for our machine, we could pulse one time every minute. We could pulse 10 times per second. So ultimately. basically you could operate on the demand. Yes. And we can do that in real time. So it doesn't take long for us to, You've to ramp up. You've already perfected that technology. So, yes. Yeah, so with our last prototype uh, that we called Trenta, we had over 10,000 fusion pulses with that machine. Um, and that's really what's given us the confidence that we're going to be able to demonstrate electricity production with our seventh machine, which is on track to be completed this year. So when you say 28, are you talking about a pulse system? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's correct. So, but keep going now. Yes. The, you, okay. I'm, I know the chairman is going to give me a little more time now because it's a collaborative. Yes. <laughs> this is, this has turned into a collaborative process. I was going to commend you on a great question. Yeah, which I think is really good. Because I really, you said, okay, you said 28. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Now, it may happen, it might not happen, but at least it starts to give us a feel, okay, we can look right. towards something. Now we want to know what you think it's going to, so you're thinking 28. Yes. And we want to know what it looks like. Right. So just elaborate yes. a little more on what this looks like. Right. So uh, for and, the actual. And, and I mean, what, you know, what it looks like in terms of what, how it works and what it's going to do. Sure. Like it's going to run some guy's lawnmower or whatever. Right. So, so in this instance, we're thinking about the power needs of Microsoft, our customer, um, for largely for data centers. Um, and this first plant is going to be 50 megawatts, and the footprint of the facility will be approximately the size of a football field, just under 30,000 square feet, um, and that is the full perimeter of the of the site. Um, and when we turn the machine on, we will be able to, as Senator Manchin alluded to, we will be able to actually ramp up or down depending on what the needs are for our customer. Wow. And, um, and then ultimately we also have a, uh, an agreement with Nucor, the largest steel producer in North America, to deploy a 500 megawatt facility. Okay, but before you get beyond it, okay, you're talking, so a facility the size of a football field, it's a 50 megawatt. Correct. And you can ramp up and down how much of that megawattage you provide, mm -hmm. which is, so it's variable. Correct. And once you've built it, does it just run, is it like nuclear fission where it essentially, you don't have that on, ongoing fuel cost? I mean, it, it costs Boku to build the thing, right? Mm -hmm. We get that. Mm -hmm. But at that point then, does that sucker just, you know, I mean, run until Manchin's like 250 years old or, I mean. Uh, so we will need to, You know what to, I mean? Yes. Like, and that's the promise of this stuff is that right. you put it in a spaceship and you go to, you know, Neptune and mm -hmm. back and it, you never need to refuel it. Right. right. So we do have, I mean, so because it's a pulse system and with any system, you're, you're still going to eventually add more fuel to the system. Um, for us, we're, we're puffing our fuel, the deuterium, the heavy water, and the helium-3 into either side of our machine. Yeah, but that's part of my question is, yeah. do you have to keep refueling? Because the promise of this right. is that it powers forever, basically, once you build it. Right. So that's so my question. For us, yes, we do need more fuel. To and that would be what? It. But So for us, it's the deuterium, heavy water, very cheap. Um, and helium-3, um, which is kind of funny, it's not widely available naturally on Earth, so we get some pretty crazy, crazy questions about folks that want to go mine the moon for us. Um, but actually, we can create helium-3 uh, yeah. right but here. But see, this part of the question really matters, because otherwise you might as well be putting gasoline or something else if you have to keep refueling, right? That diminishes the applications that we're trying to develop this for. Right. For example, a rocket ship that will fly all over, you know, to right. galaxies beyond, you know. So I don't actually see it as a challenge when it comes to our fuel, and there's a couple reasons why. Um, it is widely abundant 
and very cheap. So deuterium, for example, I'm holding some right here. So it's, it's heavy water. You can even drink it if you want to. I don't really want to, but you could. Um, and so the reason I mention this is because water is readily available and abundant on planet Earth, and we don't see any time frame in the future where we run out. So when you say heavy people. water, it's kind of like it's wa available almost like water. Yeah, precisely. Okay. That's right. Um, and so, and then for the helium three, um, actually helium three is a byproduct, first of all, of our fusion our system, and so we're actually creating more of the fuel we need just by running our machine. Uh, we can also create a separate machine that is just deuterium and deuterium fusing, and the byproduct of that is helium-3. So, so it, all of this is very cheap and provides a very sustainable fuel. So system. fission has the problem of the, the byproduct, you know, that you create nu nuclear radioactive mm -hmm. material, and Correct. what the hell do we do with it, right? If you can't completely reprocess it, nobody wants to store it, right? Mm -hmm. We think Yucca Mountain is a great example. But the nice thing about it is if you have it in your nuclear carrier, you drive all over the world for a long, long time, and you don't have to refuel anywhere, nor do you have to carry any fuel, right? That would be an advantage, an advantage of fission over fusion. So again, as you develop this new energy source, for folks that are more in the common sense lane, because they weren't good enough in math to be an engineer or a scientist like me, I'm trying to understand, okay, why is it we're spending a lot of money on this thing? When are we going to see a benefit? And how is that going to be more beneficial than other energy sources? And that's why what you're telling us now, I think, is really important compared to all this kind of theoretical stuff. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff where the rubber hits the road. Yeah, and I would just say that the, the fuel itself is actually significantly cheaper, for at least for our system, um, than when you think about uranium that's used or high assay lower enriched uranium for, for some of these advanced reactors. But the fact of the matter is, is that regardless of whether you're using a fission system or fusion system, you do have to refuel. So even in our existing nuclear power plants, you're usually looking at about a year and a half refueling cycle over there. Um, same thing with our submarines that used high enriched uranium. You still ultimately have to, to, to refuel those. After how many years? So, right. So I think there's, there's, that's still a challenge. I would say that our fuel amount that we use for just for a month in one of our systems can essentially be held in a, in a canister the size of a bowling ball. Okay. So very small amounts.